In 2015, in Queensland, Australia, a 12-year-old girl in foster care went missing. Her badly decomposed remains were discovered a week later. Whilst the hunt for her killer commenced, her foster family were inundated with messages of sympathy and messages of support. But from the outset, police suspected the true perpetrator could be someone much closer to home. Their murder investigation revealed a year of sexual abuse and a family pact to hide a terrible secret. This is what happens when the life of an innocent child is sacrificed to protect the sins of a son. This is the murder of Tealy Palmer. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. I wanted to cover this case because it's quite a while ago. I actually saw a documentary on it and it was great, but I felt like I wanted to dig really deep into this to kind of understand the nuances of the case, also to understand exactly what happened to Tia. Because it's one of those cases where it blindsides you because when children are in the foster care system, the hope is they've gone from a position that might be dysfunctional or challenging or where a primary caregiver just can't actually provide the resources the child needs to a place that's going to be better for them. And when you hear about cases like this, it kind of shocks you to the foundations because you realise that so often children are literally taken from the frying pan into the fire. So I really wanted to dig deep into this. If you're new to this channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. So if you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Also, as ever, big shout out to my YouTube membership and my Patreon subs, you make this possible. Also, it's so nice to meet you guys at my tour. I'm on tour in the UK with the Serial Killer Next Door tour. Theatre's literally everywhere. I genuinely think everywhere. And it's amazing saying hi to you guys at the end of the show. So thank you so much for joining me. Right, let's go back to 2015. That's where this case begins. We've got 12-year-old Tia Lee Alyssa Rose Palmer. Now she's better known as Tia, so I'm gonna to refer to her as Tia during this video. And she's living with her foster parents in Chambers Flat. That's in Logan City, Queensland, Australia. She was in her first year at Marsden State High School. What can I say about her? She was a really bright, popular student. She was of Maori descent and she's absolutely gorgeous. I know that that doesn't matter when it comes down to victims. I'm just saying that as a young person, when you look at her, she just looks vibrant, full of life. And she's obviously somebody that people really warm to. People described her as beautiful and bubbly. She apparently loved shopping, she loved movies, she loved dancing, and she's essentially growing into this young teenager, and she has everything to live for. Her life is literally just beginning. And obviously she's had difficulties because she's in foster care, and the hope is now that she's reached a position where things are going to be better, where things are going to be easier. Now her birth mom, that's Cindy, she was a single mom, and she'd basically given her up in 2010. This is when she was just seven years of age. The reason that she gave her up was because she had dependency issues, she had issues with drugs, and she didn't feel that she could adequately care for her. And whilst we would always wish for a parent to be present in a child's life, certainly primary caregivers that are biologically related are incredibly integral and important bringing up children. But I also have a level of respect for those who feel I cannot do the work that this child deserves. I cannot be there in the way this child needs. And it must be a very difficult decision making that choice, but this is what's happened. So this means that Tia had been in and out of care homes. Now that is not a great place for any child. I appreciate that the care system 
in the Western world is set up to try to meet the needs of children who haven't been given the opportunity to live in a foster home or haven't been adopted out of the foster network. But also, I think it symbolises a lot of dysfunction, dysregulation, chaos and constant disruption to the lives of children who don't get those foster placements and end up in and out of care. I know it needs to be there, I know it's better than nothing, but I think it'd be a really psychologically abandoning place for children, just knowing that when you close the door at night, you haven't got your people. You haven't got people who are literally there to care for you because you are in the foster system. So this isn't working essentially, and they look for a foster home for her because it's gonna be a far better opportunity for her to thrive if they find a family who's willing to take her. So fortunately, in December 2014, she ends up living with the Thorburn family. Now initially this begins as a respite care scenario, so it's from weekends that she'll go there. And it would be a very different world for her because the family itself, let's just go through who the members were. You've got Rick Thorburn, he's a truck driver. Then you've got Jolene, his wife, and there's also two young men living at the address. So you've got the two sons, that's 18-year-old Trent and 19-year-old Josh. Both of them were amateur dancers. So that's the setup of the family dynamics. But she starts visiting that home on the weekends, which would be good for her because obviously if you're living in care, it's not that family dynamic and you want to create that for a child in this situation. But soon after, and this is following a temporary protection order, which is a child protection order in January 2015, the Thorburns do become Tia's full-time carers. So now she has a place of permanence and that should be a really positive experience for her. And I suppose on the face of it, from the outside looking in and not knowing the content and context of what goes on behind closed doors, it seems that Tia's found literally the perfect home. So the property, it's lovely, it's surrounded by green lawns, it's got horses in the yard, it's got a swimming pool. And you can imagine, just even if you've never been in the care system, that living in a care home compared to living in a place covered in lush land in a swimming pool, it's gonna seem very attractive for you to move to that place. Now, in addition to fostering kids, the Thorburns also run a daycare centre from their home called Miss Julene's Family Daycare. And they also had a second business, and the second business was an American-themed food truck called Nothing Healthy Here. So obviously, as a family, they're relatively upwardly mobile. You could also say that to some degree there's a level of materialism there and it could mean that Tia has been taken in not just because of the good of their hearts but because there is a financial incentive for them to do that. But nonetheless, this is how it's played out and this is how Tia has arrived there. Now, when Tia is actually offered the opportunity to return to her birth mother's care, she chooses not to. And... I do actually feel sorry for her mother in that moment because if she has been on a child protection register and she's done the work to afford herself the opportunity to take a child back and you have to jump through hoops and rightly so to be able to do that, for your child to say no must be very hurtful. I completely understand Tia's perspective. But nonetheless, just to acknowledge the empathy for her mother in that moment, and I appreciate that she'd had problems and that she'd made choices that were really bad and that had resulted in Tia being in the situation in the first place, but nonetheless, when somebody's worked hard to try to get to a position where that's going to change, it must be difficult when you hear that the child basically says no to the opportunity. And apparently Tia had said that she just loved the horses on the Thorburn property and she wanted to stay. Now, there could well be lots of reasons behind that choice. Because first of all, even if you're living in an imperfect situation, if that imperfect situation has brought you a level of security, then that may feel a better choice to make than to go to something that has proven uncertain or challenging to your foundations before this. 
So it might not be that the Thorburns is this beautiful heavenly place that she's enjoying. It may well be more the psychological fear of things returning to the problematic situations that had afforded her before. And that in the end, she's going to get let down by her mum and she doesn't want to take that chance. But there is another reason, and that is that she has this massive crush on 18-year-old Trent. Now, bear in mind, he's six years her senior. We all know what it is like to have those massive crushes when we are young, particularly when we are a developing adolescent. We're starting to feel the rush of adrenaline when we're attracted to someone. We haven't got the capacity to consent and we need to be protected because our feelings can make us wish to do things that we are not emotionally mature enough to make choices about doing. But we all know what it's like to relate to that moment. And even if you're living in a situation that isn't perfect, when you really like someone, it makes it a lot easier. We've all been in a situation when we've had a crap job, but there's a really attractive person who works in the place that you work and you're like, maybe I'll just stay a little bit longer. It's just part of who we are as humans. But in spite of the fact that she really likes this guy and that she's making a choice now to not return home, I would say that what's happening at the Thorburns isn't perfect for her at all. So things are not as perfect as it seemed. And her previous foster carer actually told them when they investigated this case that Tia hated living with the Thorburns. So as far as they are concerned, the messages being given to social services regarding her placement with the Thorburns is not a reality. And that makes me think, well, what was going on? Because it could be that she feels that she has to say nice things about the Thorburns. Because if you're scared of somebody within the family and you're worried about the consequences of telling the truth about how you feel, then you're going to often say silent because you don't want to rock the boat and you don't want to incur any problematic behaviour that that person may express towards you. So she could just have been saying she doesn't want to go home to her mum because she doesn't feel like she's going to be in a situation of safety if she actually elects to do that and dares to speak that truth. So there are all these possible reasons psychologically, physically and also environmentally as to why she remains. Now it turns out as well that when that old foster carer obviously had that discussion, Tia never actually expressed what it was that she didn't enjoy about the Thorburns environment. But her behaviour does demonstrate, as far as I'm concerned, a real problem with the environment because she actually ran away 10 times in 10 months. Now, what is a child running from in those situations? Bear in mind what I've told you about the school. Bear in mind the fact that people really like her, warm to her, that she's a really effervescent personality and yet she's leaving that property 10 times in 10 months. That says to me that there is something within her that desperately wants to escape. Now, in the latter half of 2015, Tia's mother decides that she's going to relinquish guardianship of her daughter. So the court hearings arranged for the 5th of November 2015. And the whole premise of that is the court is going to decide essentially and confirm the orders for her future care. But we never actually get to that place. We never actually have that court hearing because just a week before it was going to play out, Tia gets murdered. So this situation, which should all have been about hope, future possibility, foundations of security, Tia finally arriving at a place where she can trust the world, it's just obliterated in the most grotesque of manners. Now, one of the things while she's living at the Thorburn property that Rick Thorburn, the dad and his wife, were unaware of is the fact that their 18 year old son, 18, bear in mind the age gap here, he'd been taking advantage of Tia's crush on him, which is just harrowing because there's a substantial age gap and also Tia's meant to be in the care of the family. This young adult is basically using Tia for his own pleasure. So when his parents are out, Tia has been having sex with Trent, obviously driven by him because he 
is the adult in this situation. And she's actually confided in a friend about what's happening. And just to put it out there, in Australia, the age of consent is the same as in the UK, so it's 16. So Trent's basically sexually abusing a vulnerable child. Let's just remember that, a vulnerable child. And he's also been talking about it. So he'd actually confided in his cousin about what he'd done in September 2015. So you can see that there is some conscience being pricked there. He knows he shouldn't be doing it. But is that stopping him? Clearly not. And sometimes people struggle when it's somebody of 18, for example, and we're talking about a very young adolescent female. There's a history of society blaming the girl in this situation as some kind of femme fatale because she allowed this kind of abuse to happen. But the reality is, the reason we have these laws and regulations and say that people cannot consent to sex under 16 is for good reason. Emotionally, psychologically, they are not actually in a position where they are mature enough to manage the fallout of sexual relationships. And also, think about the vulnerabilities that she's actually been through. She's had attachment issues, she's got abandonment issues, she's desperate, no doubt, to be loved, and he's taking full advantage of this. And the fact that he's talking to his cousin, again, shows you he knows this is highly inappropriate. Of course, he's dressed it up. He's not actually said, oh, I am molesting this child. No, he's not going to do that. He's going to make it minimal compared to the reality. So he tries to put himself in a more favourable light and he says, oh, the reason that I've been sleeping with Tia is that she coerced me into sleeping with her. She basically forced me into sleeping with her. In fact, she had said that if I didn't have sex with her, she'd hurt my dog. I kid you not. He obviously had time to think that particular excuse up. And what we can say about Trent is that he certainly isn't the brightest individual, is he? Because the reality of what he's saying there makes no sense whatsoever. I've had to have sex with this young girl, this child, because she said that she'd hurt my dog. Hmm, just going to throw it out there. Let's just have a little think about that, shall we? Should we have a little consideration about other options? Hmm, well, it's your home where she's living with your parents. I'm just going to throw it out there. Have a chat with your parents about it because I reckon that they're going to be having some strong words with her if she's going to hurt your dog if you don't have sex with a minor. I'm imagining that if that were the reality, it would be very easy resolve. And also, bear in mind, this guy's a young adult, not a child. And also, there is nothing in Tia's history whatsoever that would suggest these kind of actions are a part of her personality and character. But this is the BS that he is spinning because he knows he's banged to rights as far as what he is doing is illegal and that he could get into serious trouble if she were to actually speak out about this, which we wish she had because she had an absolute ultimate right to. She needed protection, not a predator living in the home with her. So we get to Thursday, the 29th of October, 2015. That afternoon, Juleen picks Tia up from her hip hop dance class and she's complaining about the fact that she's got stomach ache. You know, she feels that she's got these stomach pains and they must have been relatively intense if she's telling Juleen about this. And obviously, Juleen's had two other boys. She'll be used to the idiosyncrasies of them growing up and the moments where they're struggling physically. It's just very normal. And she doesn't really think very much of it. But it becomes a great deal more significant just shortly after. So when Tia gets home, she goes and takes a shower. And Trent actually goes up to his mum and starts telling her something that she immediately finds almost impossible to process. He admits that he's been having unprotected sex with a 12-year-old Tia and that he's worried that she might be pregnant. Yeah. And you know why he's worried about that? Because you can pretty much deny everything else 
you can say that she's making it all up. We see that in abuse cases all the time. I mean, how many times do we cover cases where the perpetrator just basically denies any involvement with harming the child, even when they're absolutely guilty? But the problem is, once you introduce genetics, DNA, an actual baby that can be traced to the father, who happens to be a grown-ass adult, then we're looking potentially a lengthy prison sentence for that particular predator. So he's really worried about that because he's thinking, well, this is going to really screw things up for me because if she's pregnant, there's going to be some kind of proving back to me that I am the one who's carried out this crime. And at this point, Juleen, in absolute disbelief, basically says, how could you let this happen? Because Trent has got literally no excuse for the inexcusable. Even if she had threatened the dog, which she clearly didn't. The point is that would not be a reasoning to actually go ahead and break the law and also break the trust and security and actually add to the vulnerability of a child. Now, later that afternoon, Julian's obviously been gestating over this and she's clearly very aware of the consequences. Bear in mind, they're foster parents, so they'll have been child protection trained. They know exactly where this is going. If this kind of information gets out, so Julian decides that she's got to speak to her husband. Now, despite the fact that Trent had been sexually abusing a child, a vulnerable child in their care, their only concern was for their son. And all they could think about was, Trent can end up in prison. Yeah, he can, because he's a major child predator. That's why he should end up in prison. This is not Tia's issue, this is not Tia's fault, she is the victim. But all they have is that egocentric self-interest. How do we prevent Trent serving a sentence or taking responsibility for the actions that he's actually carried out? Also, of course, they're now worried that Tia's stomach pains could actually be symptoms of pregnancy. And that will mean literally no escaping from that reality. So obviously, the home is in chaos now. The family are distressed about the actual reality of what they're managing and the possibilities of what might play out. And I have no doubt whatsoever in that moment for somebody like Julene, the horror must have been almost insurmountable because you're thinking, how has my life changed so drastically within 30 seconds? But this is where you have to start thinking as a family about how you can manage the situation effectively and how you can start teaching, particularly in this case, Trent, that actions have consequences. And those consequences may be very, very severe, but nonetheless, they are important consequences. If I had an 18 year old son and my son was sleeping with a little girl, I am going to be knocking on the door of every service as possible because I know that this does not bode well for his future and it certainly doesn't bode well for the protection of other children. So all this must have been going on in their minds, but as opposed to speaking to social services and starting to have that conversation or getting her checked out and seeing what's going on with her stomach, that doesn't play out. So later that day, Julene and her sons, they leave the house around 8 p.m., so Julene's basically gone to speak to her sister and also she's gone to speak to the cousin that Trent had confided in. Now, in retrospect, it's suspected that that likely happened because Rick wanted to get it sorted. So the fact that Julene has basically gone to say to the cousin, and I imagine it was very clearly a don't say anything, finding out exactly what that cousin knows and then saying there will be massive consequences. You have to keep this to yourself, you know, keep it in the family. But the belief is it's likely that Rick was somebody who wanted to, to go and do that. So you're kind of boxing off the issues that need to be actually confronted because he has a potential plan in his mind as to how to resolve this issue. And when I think about Rick Thorburn and the kind of the information that I've garnered whilst researching this case, I think of him as a huge bully. I mean, he's worse than that, but I just mean in general, 
he's an individual who gets what he wants. He's not somebody whose motives you're going to question. He's quite imposing. And I think he's somebody who's quite happy to use intimidation and violence to get where he wants and what he needs. As far as I can find out about him, he was somebody who, if he told you to do something, you did it. And whilst he hasn't, at least evidentially, in the research, been violent towards Julian, I think that she probably walked a tightrope and she was very aware that if she did speak out of turn or do something that he didn't want her to do, there could be some consequences. So she'd got used to not pushing him. And I think that, again, there are lots of relationships like that. It's not a good relationship where you feel that there is a particular line that can be crossed that could have really bad consequences for you. We should know in our relationships that we can say what we think, say no to a partner, reject what they are suggesting without feeling that we're putting ourselves at any risk. And the only time that we cross boundaries and completely abandon the things that they want, need and desire is often when we are thinking about leaving that relationship for the good reasons that we're not connecting any longer. So that's when you'll be in a situation where you will literally push those boundaries to a point where you don't want to actually stay in that situation. But with her, it's like she's in this situation and she doesn't want to push anything for fear that something might play out that wouldn't actually be very positive for her. Now, his family, they were really aware that he was capable of extreme violence, genuinely. So that's why his family thought of him. Now, it seems that he did have quite a tough childhood. He had a very long-standing history of depression, although, let's be honest, depression does not make you a violent murderer. But obviously, it can mean that in a family, when somebody is struggling with their mental health, you feel that you want to act in a way that doesn't frustrate them or add further to their problems. And that might mean that you try to behave yourself so that you don't add any more issues to a situation that's challenging enough. But like I said, absolutely nothing to do with being violent. I mean, lots of people are depressed and lots of people have depressive disorders and actually they're more likely to harm themselves, not anybody else. But what he also has, and which is absolutely terrifying as far as I'm concerned is, he had historic convictions for previous sex offences. Yeah. Can we just all let that sink in for a minute? How the hell, as a man, with historic convictions for previous sex offences, being allowed anywhere near a child with vulnerabilities in the foster system. How has he been seen as an appropriate guardian ad litem? Tell me that. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. In the UK, you cannot be within 100 yards of a child when it comes down to fostering them if you have been in trouble for sex offences. It's horrific. And yet, here we are, talking about a child who's had a really, really challenging childhood being placed basically with a massive predator. Now, Rick, on the evening that the rest of the family leave the house, he's alone in the home with Tia for about two hours that evening. And then when Julian and the two boys arrive back around 10 p.m., Rick's just sitting by himself in the lounge. Now, Julian asks her husband, as you would, is Tia feeling any better? And Rick literally just replies to her, He'd taken care of it. Yeah. That's his response. I've taken care of it. Julene has that feeling in the pit of her stomach immediately, fears the worst, and says, what do you mean? And he says, don't ask any questions. The less you know, the better. Just all act normally. That's his advice. And then he adds to that, Tia is no longer with us. And says that, he hopes that they all understand what he means by this. And then he goes on to say, listen, the only thing that's important in this situation is protecting Trent. You know, the child predator. He's the only one that we should really care about. And he says, the next day, when you get up, you've just got to carry on as if nothing has happened. Just all stick to our usual routines. And also, we all stick to the same story. 
And that story is that Rick, as usual, has dropped Tia off at school. He then also goes on to say to his two sons, you need to make sure that you're both out of the house the following evening and to make sure that lots of people see you, basically creating an alibi for their movements. And he then says to the family, he'd hidden Tia and that he needed to dispose of her. He even tells them that he knows of a good place. Can you imagine that situation playing out? in real time. I appreciate Julian is protective of her son who is a child predator. I appreciate that she may be scared of her husband who is clearly a violent sex predator sadist just going off his history and current state of affairs but when he basically admits to the entire family I have killed her because he can use what words he likes, but clearly using words like dispose of her demonstrates the fact that she's no longer with us. As much as you may nod your head and be like, okay, sure, we'll just go ahead with your plan. The minute you get, I don't know, 10 seconds free, you call emergency services and you make damn sure that none of you are co-conspirators to this horrific crime because you care about the fact that we're talking about a little girl's life being snubbed out. But that's not what happens. That's not what happens at all. So after this has been said, Julian actually goes towards Tia's bedroom door. I guess that she had some kind of inquisitive nature in that moment and was probably trying to process, am I living in the twilight zone where during the drive home, I've entered a new universe and this isn't actually where I live at all. And if I just walk through that door, maybe I will return to the place that I used to exist. You can imagine that she's having that kind of out of body experience and she wants to confirm things for herself or to realize that he's having some kind of weird breakdown and he's just saying things that don't make any sense. But as she walks towards Tia's bedroom door, Rick blocks her path and says, don't go in there and just says you need to go to bed. I mean, honestly, I cannot relate to this. I doubt that any of you can relate to this. The idea of being ordered to go to bed after somebody has just suggested that they've murdered a child in my care, it is incomprehensible. He even goes on and says, look, tomorrow's just going to be a normal day. But for this family, nothing is ever going to be normal again, nor with respect should it be. Now, the following morning, just as instructed, the family proceed with their normal routines. So, Grit goes to the gym with Josh. And at this point, Julie naturally goes into Tia's room and she kind of looks around. It looks quite messy, as you'd expect for a teenage girl's room. But the one thing that she notes is the absence of Tia. Now, she has time and space, doesn't she here? At the end of the day, Rick's at the gym with Josh. She can be hot-footing it to the authorities and saying, come and rescue me from my murderous husband. But no, she doesn't do that. Instead of going to the police with all these concerns, when she had the chance, she just keeps it quiet. Now, Rick had actually left very early that morning. So this is before any of the children turned up at the house for daycare. And the reason that he did this, because bear in mind, this is a care facility as well. I mean, this is just terrifying, isn't it? We're literally talking about this kind of murderous monster having access to children because they have this facility at their home. And he has the capacity to do what we're talking about right now. It's so incongruent with what we should send our children towards when we think that they're being cared for, isn't it? And I suppose that the fact that they were fostering Tia gave them more leverage because people are like, oh, these are really good people. I can send my child there for daycare because at the end of the day, these are the kind of people who take children in. And that's really challenging to just imagine because you think about the mindset of this couple, there's just such a high manipulation level and a willingness to deny the rights of a child to safety and yet they've got daycare. 
Now, the reason that he's actually left so early is because usually he did actually do the school drop off. So he didn't want anyone noticing that Tia wasn't in his car because that could alert suspicion. So he's really consequentially thinking. This isn't somebody who's had a night and realized, my God, what have I done to this child? I need to go and turn myself in. No, he's just been contemplating more and more how to consequentially remove any opportunity to be caught. Now, later that morning, a youth worker does actually call from Tia's school and they call because she's basically missed an appointment. Now, at this point, Rick and his wife, of course, bring in the am-dram level to their actions and they like feign concern. They're saying that they're worried about her whereabouts. They say, well, we dropped her off at school that morning. And because Tia had also got an appointment scheduled that afternoon, Rick goes to collect her. Yes, the play acting goes this far. He knows she's not at school. He knows she's never coming home again. But he still turns up to collect her so that everyone can kind of see that he's just going through the motions. Well, he must be really innocent because at the end of the day, he's turned up to actually get his foster daughter. At this point, he's informed that she hadn't been in school all that day and the alarm is raised. So Rick contacts the Queensland police, reports her missing. And at this point, the police start a search for Tia. Now, as far as I am concerned, and anybody with an inch of ration existing in their brain, you'd think that the police would be like, this is really worrying. This really young child with vulnerabilities has just disappeared off the face of the earth. But the truth is, the initial police response was nowhere near as rigorous as it should have been. And why? Because, of course, Tia's has run away 10 times in 10 months, so... It'll just be another runaway, as if it's ever okay for a young girl to just run away without everybody going out of their way to find her and bring her back to safety. It should just be as intense as any other scenario when a child goes missing, because they can come to harm. Also, there was quite a lot of confusion about which department had authority to even go and release details to the public, and I kid you not, Six days would pass before a missing person alert was even released. Six days. Can you imagine the amount of opportunity that gives to somebody who's a perpetrator? I mean, to say it's a head start is just the biggest understatement ever. Now, Tia's biological family are really distressed. Of course they are. This little girl who they think's being taken care of has just disappeared off the face of the earth and the family and friends will start joining the search, as did Rick Thorburn and his family because they are now fully invested in the dramatisation of the people that they wish they were as opposed to the people that they know they are. They put all these alerts on social media, they've got inquiries being made with basically everybody that she knows, seeing whether they can turn up information, they speak to her friends, associates, they speak to teaching staff, students at her school. Rick, aka murderous sex predator monster, he actually posts a message on Facebook about her disappearance the day that he actually reports her missing. I mean, he's in full play acting mode, isn't he? And it read, if any of her friends are hiding her, again, please do the right thing. Let us know. She needs to come home where she belongs. Oh, to actually read you that, it almost gets stuck in my throat. It is diabolical when you know that what we're talking about is her murderer is putting that message out simply to try to deflect any potential blame or suspicion off himself. And he gets loads of messages of sympathy and support because of course the world around you is devastated when they find that a child goes missing and lots of people want to help. So everybody's feeling sorry for the family because they're heroes, they've taken in a foster child and now she's disappeared and they're really scared. And you can just feel the mentality of that attitude and how it feeds in to the confidence that Rick would have about actually getting away with murder. Now that night, it's around 8pm, 
Rick actually tells his wife that there's something that he needs to do, he says don't ask any questions. And he even made sure to leave his phone. And he said to her, look, if any text messages come through, you need to answer them whilst I'm gone. So we all know what that's about. He wants to leave a digital footprint in his residence so that people think he's in when actually he's gone out particularly with the respond to my text messages, which is a surprising one because everybody has their own individual signature when it comes to text messages. So for example, whenever I text, it really doesn't matter who you are. I either put a smiley face or a kiss. I write in a particular way. My brother always says I write too many words when only a few will do. So everybody has an independent way of expressing themselves. And when you try to answer for somebody else, it often gives away your personal style. But nonetheless, that's what he's hoping. No one's gonna question because my phone is gonna be left at home. So she actually goes to the window in the kitchen and she watches what he does. And she watches Rick actually back the family car into the garage. And even though she didn't see anything, she must have known full well what was going on. She must have known that he was loading Tia's body into that boot. So he must have known that this is the opportunity he has to remove her body from the actual premises before people start investigating. So it takes about half an hour for him to be organized and he sets off. And it's at this point whilst Rick's away that Josh and Trent actually return home. And Julene goes so far as to tell these boys that their father was disposing of Tia's body. Now, I don't know why she did that. I think part of it is because they have all been to some degree sworn to secrecy by the father. I also imagine that the psychological burden of knowing that this has happened was probably too much to bear and she wants to share it. And even though Trent is one of the reasons behind the motivation for this murder, I also think that she's probably saying it to them because she might have some kind of banal hope that they're going to actually turn him in or she wants them to manage the responsibility that she's feeling in that moment because she knows fundamentally and absolutely what's happened is absolutely outside the realms of ration and completely, completely unforgivable. And also, she probably is looking to just confide in them to discuss the potential and possibility of what do they do next. But the problem with that is, as a parent, your kids look to you to make the decisions. So unless you're saying, I think we need to tell the police about this, it's highly unlikely they're going to do anything. And Trent's certainly not, because he's just thinking, caught in the headlights, bloody hell, what's happened? I'm a big part of this, and I'm going to get into trouble, seriously, if anyone finds out. So her even giving that information demonstrates the confusion that's going on, but also the lack of responsibility that she wishes to take, which is why she's actually sharing it with the boys. Now, Rick doesn't actually get home that evening until about 11 p.m. and he is covered in dirt, so we all know what he was doing, and he just says to the family, it's done. Now, if there were ever a clear description of power in a relationship. This is it. Rick has done the unthinkable, the unspeakable, the unforgivable, and he's so confident of his power over that family, and also he's so warped in his belief that somehow he's a kind of hero in this story, he's protecting his own he actually feels able to tell them what he's done and tell them that he's disposed of her and buried her without fearing that he, they're going to go and actually tell the authorities. That is powerful. And that is also, like I say, incredibly warped. Now, meanwhile, the police are obviously searching for Tia because they desperately want to find her. They look at CCTV in the locality and they're checking all of this out to make sure that she hasn't been seen walking anywhere or being taken by anyone. They put missing posters all over the local area. It's in the community. They hand out images of her at the shopping centre, but there's literally no trace of the missing 12-year-old girl. No one has seen her. No one knows where she is. And I imagine at this point in time, they're starting to really question as far as the authorities are concerned, how a child can literally disappear into thin air. 
Now, all this changes on the 5th of November 2015. This is six days after Tia's last been seen alive. And it's three fishermen who actually find her remains. So they discover the remains of a young female. It's in a secluded area. It's on the banks of the Pimpampa River, which is on the Gold Coast. And the body at the moment in time of discovery is believed to be a female aged between the ages of 12 and 18. And one of the things that they immediately notice is that she's naked, except for her underpants. Also, her head and arms have been partially submerged in the water. And you can appreciate that when people are placed in water, often decomposition is quite quick. And because of this, it makes it absolutely impossible to establish how she actually died. They just had a bruise on the scalp that they could identify, but the remains were not in a situation where they could figure out how she had ultimately met her death. It doesn't take them long. They're able to confirm that the remains are those of Tia and her body had actually been found around 30 kilometers from where she'd last been seen. So Rick has obviously placed her there to try to make it look like maybe she did run away, maybe somebody found her, collected her, killed her, disposed of her. And he is organized to some degree in the way he thinks of that and plays out the possibility of being seen as an innocent party to this gruesome murder. Also, I'm really disturbed by the fact that she's found mostly naked because I cannot comprehend for any second how that would play out unless there was a sexual motive to the crime. I genuinely think, why was she only in her pants? Why was she only in the knickers? It doesn't make sense to me. Now the police immediately think, look, we're looking at a homicide here, she's been murdered. And they start formulating this potential idea about how it's played out. So maybe she wanted to skip school, she got picked up and she got killed by a passing motorist. But whilst they're considering that option, they're also thinking, you know what? It could be that we need to look at a killer much closer to home. So this is very much from the get go. They're thinking there's something about this. Maybe we're looking at the possibilities of this stranger stealing this child and murdering her when really the very people who should have been protecting her, caring for her, being compassionate, caring foster parents, maybe they're the people who know a lot more about what happened to this child. Now they do the autopsy and as is expected because of decomposition, they couldn't establish the cause of death, but they do conclude that it's likely she died on the evening of the 29th of October, 2015. Now, police divers do actually find one of her shoes. It's about 100 metres from her body, but the rest of her clothes were missing. And they actually did a search because she should have had a pink Mambo-style backpack and she should have had a school uniform, of course. Remember, she skipped school, so surely she would have been dressed in a school uniform and they want to find that because, of course, it can provide vital forensic evidence. It could link a person to the crime and they could essentially discover the perpetrator. At this point, the police don't know. They have their suspicions, but they don't know exactly what happened. So they start where they would expect to start, which is interviewing the Thorburn family. And as instructed, of course, by Rick, the Thorburn family have got this cast iron reality of what played out. They've all stuck to the same story. They say that Tira stayed in bed for the entire evening on the 29th of November 2015. And then on the following morning of Friday the 30th of November 2015, Rick had dropped her off at school as usual. Rick confirms, yeah, I dropped Tira off at 10 past eight in the morning. And his son actually said, yeah, I talked to Tia that morning when she was actually getting ready for school. And the family go ahead and stick to that false version, that fabricated absolute major lie for many, many months. And they give statement after statement to the police reflecting those lies. So they're starting to almost believe that those lies are the truth. 
Now we get to the 14th of November 2015 and at this point we have Tia's funeral and wow. There is something quite magnificent about human beings in these moments. I think when a child is murdered, it touches something within us that is so deep, it's cerebral, it's visceral, it makes us feel like something so wholly wrong has happened and we can't redress the balance, nothing's going to change that, but we can make it clear how we feel about that. And when you see a child die in these circumstances, the turnout at the funeral is usually incredible, and it is for Tia. Hundreds turn out. It's at Brisbane Anglican Maori Mission in Cornobia, and people all dress in purple because it's their favourite colour. They've got hundreds of purple balloons that they release, and even members of the Maori community, they actually perform the hacker. So they're in a situation where they're really elevating who she is culturally as well as who she is as a much-loved child. What gets my goat is obviously we've got this family lying about what's played out, we've got this family knowing who the perpetrator is, but they have the goal, the absolute goal, to allow Rick to be one of the pallbearers. So yeah, there's pictures of him carrying in this white coffin into the chapel. He has killed this child and he's there, centre stage. In fact, the family took pride of place during the service. How can you do that? What kind of mentality, what kind of monsters are you that you are willing to actually take the sympathy and empathy of the local population and to have pride of place at a child's funeral that you know was murdered by somebody in your family? Just have some humility, have some integrity, just step back. But no, because this is again all part of the play acting that in the role. Now months pass and as far as the police and the public are concerned, Tia's killer at this point remains this unidentified and at large perpetrator. And even though there are suspicions that maybe somebody closer to home had killed her, there's not really that much evidence. So they end up putting this $250,000 reward, which is a huge amount of money, for any information that can lead to the arrest or conviction of the killer. Now, at this point, new footage of Tia, which was from CCTV in her classroom, gets released. And this is really important, of course, because it might jog somebody's memory. You might suddenly think, oh my God, I saw that kid. Yeah, I saw who they were and where they were going and oh, I saw that person pick them up and so on and so forth. So these kind of TV moments where they release this information is really pivotal. And all the while that this has been happening, by the way, the Thorburn family haven't had a breakdown. They're not falling apart at the seams. People aren't looking from the outside in and thinking, God, what's going on there? No, they just continue life as normal. They're running their two businesses, just getting on with it day to day. Now, as I said, police from the very outset of the murder investigation thought that Rick Thorburn could be the killer. The problem is proving it. The problem is piecing together the breadcrumb trail of guilt. So we get to the 29th of June 2016 and also the 1st of July 2016. And it's here that the Thorburn family provide what can only be described as BS evidence to the Crime and Corruption Commission. Yeah, basically they're just giving the false evidence over because they've got so used to it. Now, this particular body, the Crime and Corruption Commission, they're an independent body and it's set up to tackle major crime in Queensland, which obviously Tia's death would fall under. And police at this point are just really unsure about them. There's something that makes them feel quite disconcerted about this family. Maybe it's the way that they stick to the story exactly. Maybe it's because they don't enter new information. It always sticks to this idea of this is ultimately what happened. This is how she disappeared. This is us absolutely on a formulaic level handing over to you the information that we've concocted. And that is actually something that helps you to sniff out liars because when you have a memory you only ever have a memory of a memory. And every time you go back to the memory, your memory is a memory of that memory and so on and so forth. So you never really have the authentic experience memorized correctly. 
And also what tends to happen when you are truthful and when you've been through a certain experience is over time, you remember other aspects that you might not have remembered. There won't be major discrepancies, but there'll just be something that you will add to the story. And if you're not doing that, it's because you're not sticking to a memory or an event or an experience. You're sticking to something that you've concocted in a linear way. And the police must be feeling this. So they figure out, look, the only way we're gonna know is if we install covert listening devices in the Thorburns family home and we kind of listen in. So they do this for about a month and it's shocking. So all those suspicions that they've got, all those concerns about their behavior, they're all picked up during this period. So first of all, they hear Rick and Julian literally coaching their sons on what to say to the police. They tell them it's really important that you don't say anything about Trent's sexual misconduct with Tia. And in one part of the highly incriminating recording, Julian said this, we have to stick to the same story about going to school the next day and whatever. So coaching them and again, confirming to all of us, they aren't gonna take any responsibility for this. They wanna get away with murder. They wanna carry on the rest of their lives, thank you very much. They don't even want any reputational damage towards the family, no. So just stick to the story. Then in another, Rick actually advises Trent on what to say if he's questioned about his sexual relationship with Tia. So he says, look, you tell them, she came into your room, you remember waking up, you were still drunk, you were still whatever. So actually giving him a reasoning as to why this little girl has become this sexual attacker towards him and he's the innocent party because he was drunk. He didn't realise that there was this little 12 year old girl coming on to him and so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. But how malevolent, how disgraceful to actually try to blame the innocent party in this situation who's also had her life stolen. Just no care, compassion, consideration, or reality, or responsibility and accountability for what has actually played out. However, one thing that I think Rick underestimated was the weight of conscience that starts to impact on Julene and also her eldest son, Josh. Because in front of Rick, they're just going along with everything because I obviously believe that they're scared of him. And I think we're talking about a very dangerous man. We know what his actions have been, but also in the past he's been done for sex offences. So we can understand that maybe in front of him, they're nodding their heads and saying all the right things. But there is a possibility that they're hiding the true feelings. And because of that fear, they know that they can't say in front of him what they're really thinking, but they start talking about the possibility of telling the truth. And Julian actually states to Josh, we have to come clean, that's just between you and I, dad made the decision to go down that path. And unfortunately, we are gonna have to live with it. So she's kind of given that clear message, which is, listen, if the police come knocking, then we are gonna squeal because this was your dad, it's on your dad. Yes, we've become co-conspirators. Yes, we have hidden the truth. Yes, we have done things that are highly illegal, but we are not taking the full fall for this man. We get to the 13th of September, 2016. Now, the police at this point actually sees a blue Ford car that Rick had previously owned. He'd sold it just after Tia's disappearance. And at this point, they even bring all four of the family members in for questioning. So the forensic officers, they've got like this mammoth task. First of all, it involves digging up the backyard at the family home. And the reason that they want to do that is they're looking for this elusive missing uniform and backpack of tears. And you can imagine now the destabilization, particularly in the wife and the son's experience where they're thinking, wait a minute, we've had this story straight. We've told them all what happened. They're clearly not believing us. That's going to have destabilized the way that they feel about this situation and going to increase that level of culpability and conscience because they are in deep with this. So we get to the 20th of September, 2016. This is almost a year after the killing 
56 year old Rick Thorburn is actually arrested and charged with Tia's murder. And even though the police were slow to start in this case and those six days passed with all that confusion about who was responsible and with the information about her being missing, I do feel that from that moment onwards they were like a dog with a bone. They wanted to find whoever was responsible for this child's murder and I think that they zoned in and homed in on Rick and were just waiting for that opportunity. So they arrest him and they actually charge him with Tia's murder and with interfering with a corpse and disposing of her body now initially he does the classic says absolutely nothing to the investigators and i suppose that he's hoping well you know what they couldn't find and determine the cause of death so are they actually going to be able to pin it on me is there any forensic evidence and so on and so forth i'm going to say nothing in the hope that eventually i'm going to get released so even though it had been impossible to determine during the autopsy what the cause of death was, the authorities suspected that the way she'd been killed would have been by smothering. So that would actually explain why there was no obvious signs of trauma on her remains. But they also believe that he might have sexually assaulted Tia before her death. I have no doubt whatsoever. This man is a monster and predator of the highest order. I think what we've described about the way her body was found that tells a story itself. Now, they can't confirm that. Her body was too decomposed, and that's something, therefore, that we can only suggest is a possibility, but there is nothing about this man's behavior that would make me feel that that was not the most obvious possibility. I genuinely think that. In fact, I'm gonna be honest with you, it would not surprise me if that's why she had run away 10 times in 10 months. He was already a sexual predator pervert. A beautiful young girl in his home, vulnerable. He has access to her. I could easily see that playing out. Also, the magnitude of the reaction when he finds out that Tia might be pregnant. Let's just think about that for a second. Listen. There is something terrifying about realising that your own son is a sexual predator, is a child abuser. That is horrifying. That is terrifying. But even if you confront that and your child has to serve a sentence, he will have a life and a future with your support. But if you're also abusing that child and you realise that she might be pregnant and you think they might find out that I'm also a sexual predator, then maybe that explains the magnitude of the reasoning behind the murder. That's why he goes to such a length, because he's not just saving the skin of his son, he's saving the skin of himself. I can only tell you that's my thoughts, I'm not saying it's evidence, but that's where my brain goes in this situation, it's too extreme the reaction. And also, Rick's clearly a narcissist. Why would he care about the consequences for his child? But he would care about the consequences for himself. Now, later the same month that he's been arrested, Julene and Josh are charged with perjury, rightfully so. They're also charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice. And they ultimately agreed to plead guilty to all charges because they are massively banged to rights. They cannot avoid it. It's obvious they are guilty as hell. And of course, there's a bit of a deal going on, as there would be, because my God, I can't imagine for one minute that they are not people who realise what a monster they've been living with. So they agree to act as prosecution witnesses against Rick and rightfully so. It doesn't redeem their actions in any way, but at least it means that he is going to be sentenced appropriately. Now, Julene told the police that as a mother, I wanted to protect my family. I was embarrassed. Not good enough, Julene. Not good enough. Your feelings don't matter. I can't quite comprehend whether we've just reached a time in the past few decades where feelings actually usurp 
the reality of what's happened and people believe that they're entitled to think more about whether it offends them or whether it upsets them or whether it embarrasses them than whether they should actually strive to do the right thing. But that's a perfect example. She wanted to protect her family. She was embarrassed. And of course, Josh, who I do have a bit of sympathy with, to be honest, he claims that he was made to lie as part of a family pact. And when you're a young person, it's pretty difficult to go against the grain of your family, particularly when you love members of your family, and it's going to get them in serious trouble. But he's just kind of collateral damage in this, isn't he? Now, Jolene ends up getting an 18-month prison sentence, which is utterly ludicrous. How is 18 months acceptable? Literally, they would have done nothing and got away with it for the rest of their lives and had no consequences. And a child died diabolically after being molested in your care for 18 months. Josh gets a three month sentence. I will be honest, I have more sympathy for that. I think Josh was probably an unwilling party drawn and dragged into this. I'm not excusing his choices. I'm saying it's more understandable. Now, Trent, of course, He's somebody who has gone a lot further. So Trent Thorburn is actually charged with incest. Also, rightfully so, he's charged with perverting the course of justice. He's charged with two counts of perjury and he's sentenced to four years in prison. Yeah, in September 2017. Four years. Four years. I cannot compute it. Honestly, I can't. There is a massive chain of causation, part of what he did to that child by molesting her led to the events that we're talking about right now. Four years is ludicrous. But it seems to me, certainly in the last decade, that child sex offences are just not being taken seriously. Honestly, I cannot wrap my head around it. We let these dangerous predators have these really short sentences and then we're surprised when our society turns to shit and when children can't trust that they will be safeguarded by the adults who should protect them. Now shortly after Rick is actually charged with murder he collapses of a suspected heart attack they end up having to put him into an induced coma they actually believe down the line that he'd taken an overdose because he wanted to attempt suicide or at least try to kill himself because narcissists like to be in control don't they and in the end he ultimately pleads guilty to all charges because there's no other option that's in May 2018 and he's sentenced to life in prison he's gonna have to serve a minimum of 20 years which seems negligible and he'll actually be eligible for parole in 2036 so he might have an opportunity to be free which I don't understand. He is such a perpetrator. He's clearly somebody who's incredibly dangerous. He's willing to do whatever he feels he needs to do to protect himself. And one day he might walk the streets again, whereas Tia didn't even get to live her teenage years. Now, when there was an inquest, which is in 2021, which was all about Tia's death, Rick admitted oh, this is something that really gets my goat, that he may have accidentally smothered her during an argument. I mean, something that just is so common. You're just having a bit of an argument with one of your kids or with your partner, and the next minute you've smothered them to death with a pillow. If that isn't happening, every other 25 minutes in homes all over the world, I don't know what's happening. Nobody can accidentally smother anyone of an age of 12. First of all, they fight back. Secondly, it takes some time. Thirdly, you know what you're doing because you had to get something to smother them with, either your hands or a pillow or some object of some type. There's a lot of opportunity to take a step back and think, oh my God, I might hurt this person, but no. In the inquest, that's what he says. May have accidentally smothered her. You know, like all these murders that happen, it's just an accident. I just accidentally stabbed him. I just accidentally smashed him in the head with a hammer. I just accidentally locked them in a room and left them there without food for six months. You don't accidentally kill somebody in this way. 
but apparently Rick does. And he actually provided no further information aside from that. This is again where thumb screws could possibly be a good thing to implement. I'm not going as far as hanging, drawing and quartering, even for me, I think that's a little bit, I don't know, Stone Age. But nonetheless, if you're not willing to provide information to the coroner, to the family who have lost this child, as in the biological one, mm, I do feel there should be some, shall we say, incentives, some painful incentives that could bring along more information that would be helpful. Anyway, this is what happens. So to some degree, that's Rick dealt with. And then we have Trent. So Trent gets incarcerated with this pithily sentence. And it's not long after he's incarcerated, he actually gets attacked by fellow inmates. And part of that is because obviously the case has been massively publicised and people in prison cannot believe that this man has been abusing this little girl. Sex offenders in prison often have a very difficult time for good reason. Because at the end of the day, even offenders who might be inside for violent crimes consider that kind of crime despicable. Because even when you are an offender who may have lived a challenging criminal life and done things that are reprehensible and wrong and that you deserve to be in prison for, you're still often hardwired to protect children. And when somebody has failed to do that, you want retribution. So he gets attacked. And because of that, he ends up spending most of his sentence in solitary confinement, segregated from the main prison population because it's too difficult and too dangerous for him. And of the four years, the piffly pathetic four years that he gets sentenced to, he served 16 months. 16 months before he gets released. That's in January 2018. What is the message? that sent out to victims. Just think about that psychologically. And I know that some of you, because you talk to me on the live premieres and you get in contact with me privately and you write bravely in the comment section that you have been victims of sexual abuse. You have been victims of rape. What message are we giving you when these kind of perpetrators get 16 months inside? when they're protected at a cost to the taxpayer because even the prisoners think they're despicable human beings. Tia died. She was murdered after months of being molested and he gets four years and serves less than two. In fact, less than one and a half. The message is, hey, it's not really that important. The horror you endured didn't really matter. The situation we didn't take seriously. It's the shame and guilt that then is projected back onto the victim. And this is happening more and more and more. This case is shocking. You've got the extreme narcissism displayed by Rick Thorburn. All that mattered was him and his family's welfare. I would just say all that mattered was protecting himself really, but we'll throw the family welfare in there. Without hesitation, he was prepared to literally snuff out the life of an innocent child just to cover up his actions of his son, like I said, probably of himself as well. And he had the power and manipulation to coerce the entire family into lying to the authorities for a long time. And apparently this is all out of a desire to protect the family and the lifestyle. I do believe it's probably because of what I said earlier on as well. And I think for the family, it was easy to just carry on as normal. And I do think there was a fear of Rick. I do think they perpetuated the lies because of that, but it's inexcusable. When you think about the fact that we're looking and talking about a murder that was so preventable, so preventable, it was pointless in so many ways. And I don't mean that Tia was pointless. She was a person of great meaning and magnitude. I'm saying it was pointless. You know, we were talking about Trent's sexual abuse of Tia potentially being known. And there would have been ramifications and results. But their family would have been able to carry on. Trent would have been released from prison and life would have continued. And Tia would have got the help that she desired and desired. But no, it was easier to actually dispose of this child 
than to face those consequences. And actually, when all comes to all, everything comes to light and the whole family end up in prison, even though the substandard sentences are astonishing. But what is truly astonishing is that a young girl with everything to live for had her future stolen by this selfish, egocentric narcissist who cared more about his freedom, his future, his family, his reputation than the future of this beautiful child. A future she had a right to live. A future that she had the right to carve out in spite of the dysfunction of her experiences in childhood. And he took all of that away without even a care or a concern and make no bones about it. He didn't care about her even for a moment. She was nothing, an object. And an object that he felt became too complicated and who he believed he had a right to dispose of and dismiss. And that is another thing that really affects me because she had already dealt with the abandonment and the problematic experiences in her childhood. And the message was that maybe she wasn't as important as other children, but she absolutely was. And that foster home should have helped her understand that and help her thrive. And instead, look at what we're talking about today. I have such a sympathy and empathy as well for her biological family. They could never have predicted this. I think her mum absolutely probably thought she was doing the right thing and they have to live now with the hole and void that's been created by this little girl's loss. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Please let me know in the comments section. I am so angry about the sentencing in this because it just feels so inappropriate and so unrealistic when you compare it to the actual things that happened to that little girl. Let me know your thoughts. And as ever, this is absolutely dedicated to you, Tia. I'm sure that you are flying high. I'm sure that you are drenched in love. And I am sure that one day you will get to pull the lever as Rick Thornburn is delivered to his maker in a very, very, very hot, burning, eternal carriage that will shortly be his eternal prison. And maybe the devil's into hang, drawing and quartering certain individuals too. Let's hope Rick finds out. Take care. This is for you, Tia.